Amen. Thank you, Leisha. That was wonderful. Sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes it takes the sea. And all that Jesus asks is that we just say yes. You can save yourself a lot of mountains, a lot of valleys, a lot of sea problems if you just say yes. It's not that difficult. You say yes to many, many things throughout the day and throughout your life. And it's very easy just to say yes. The hard part is getting you to be willing to say yes. That's the hard part. But I have a question this morning before I get into my message, before Pastor puts the slide up. Let me ask you this question. Does God hate anyone? Does God hate anyone? Now, you've heard many times the saying, you know, uh, God hates sin but loves the sinner. And I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to go home and I want you to look throughout the Bible, and I want you to find that God loves the sin, but he hates, he, he hates the sin, but loves the sinner. That's your homework. I want you to find that scripture somewhere, or that thought in, in the scriptures. So my initial question was, does God hate anyone? I'm getting shifting eyes. And they're saying in their minds, what is pastor up to? What if I answer incorrectly? Well, let me put it this way, all right? Let's, let's show our hands, okay? And before we do that, we want to welcome those who are watching by uh, Facebook this morning. God bless you. We're glad that you're with us. Um, and uh, we uh, are glad that you can join us uh, Sunday morning, Wednesday nights. God bless you, Brother Sajiv in India. He watches faithfully every Sunday and every Wednesday. And um, you know what would be kind of neat? Kevin, come up here a minute. Brother Sajiv in India, uh, we're, we're, we're broadcasting right now live. And uh, right now in India, he's watching us and he's looking at us. And uh, I want somebody from China to say hello to Brother Sajiv in India. Okay. Uh, hi, brother. Um, Sajiv. Sajiv. Uh, hi. And uh, um, oh, where's hope, the camera? <laughs> hope someday. So hope someday you get to meet him. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad to. Yeah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We just connected three nations together. In in a, in a short period of time, ten years ago, we couldn't do that. But today we can connect nations together. China. India, and other most parts of the world. And, you know, it just amazes me, and I'm so thankful that God uses us. And when I say us, when, you, when I go to these nations and I go to these places, I don't go just representing me. I go representing you. And I go re representing Christ, and I represent our church, and I represent our ministry. So all that you do, I just want to take this little commercial time out if I can to say thank you for standing with us financially standing with your tithes and your offerings that God is, is putting into the ministry that gives us the ability to reach out to the nations, maybe not on the same scale as some of the larger ministries, but you know what? It doesn't make a difference. We're reaching people that they're not reaching. Pastor Sajiv is reaching people. When I went to China, we reached people. I'll never forget that experience when I went to China and over 500 people came to Christ. That was an amazing, amazing missions that we went on. But anyway, my original question, back to that. God bless you. Thank you, Kevin. Does God hate anyone? With a show of hands, if you would say yes, raise your hand. One, two, three. If you would say no, raise your hand. Okay, so the no's are saying God doesn't hate anyone. Well, that's not what the scripture says. Okay, and so we only had a few that raised your hand, so after church you get a lollipop <laughs> for answering the question. I'll have to go get one and, and owe it to you, though. Praise God. Well, right now, I just want to share this uh, message with you. It's entitled today, Evil Plowing, Evil Praying. Evil Plowing, Evil Praying. And uh, let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you and praise you for your word, and I pray, God, that you will, by your spirit, uh, move and have your way in this service, Lord, that you would speak to your 
people's hearts and encourage them, Lord, and, and move them and build them up so that they can stand in these perilous times that we live in. And God, I'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, just in case anyone uh, was wondering, I've got a, just a couple of scriptures I'll read here about, about God and what he says. Psalm 5.5 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before thine eyes. Thou dost hate all who do iniquity. Okay. Psalm 11.5, The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Leviticus 20.23, 20, Moreover, you shall not follow the customs of the nations, which I shall drive out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I have abhorred them. Proverbs 6, 19, uh, uh, 6, 16 to 19. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue. That's only people talk, right? <laughs> Hands that shed innocent blood. Those are men and a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. In Hosea 9.15, All their evil is at Gilgal indeed. I came to hate them there. God does hate. We live in a world of God, love, 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 love. And yes, God is love, and that's part of his essence and it's part of his nature. But so is also hatred to those who do iniquity. Amen. I only got one or two over here. I got nothing on this side, so I guess let's try it again. Can I get a good amen? amen. All right, good. Uh, so I want to talk about evil plowing and evil praying. Now, how many of you, when you were young, you know, and you were just a boy or a girl, and, and your mom and dad asked you to take out the garbage or something, you kind of made out all kinds of excuses. My wrist hurts, my neck hurts, I'm not feeling well. You know, and we kind of, even when it came to going to school at times, and we didn't want to go to school, we said, oh, Lord, I, I, you know, God, I'm, I'm, Mom, Dad, I'm not feeling well today. I, can I stay home? You know, I got a stomach ache. Oh, I got a stomach ache, Mom and Dad. You know, and sometimes it would work, and sometimes it would, okay? And, uh, and what happened a lot of times is, and you know this if you have children, and I don't have children, but I observe a lot, and uh, I love children, and, uh, and I've seen it throughout the years. You know, when, you, when your kid is sick and you, you feel bad for them and you, you leave them, you let them stay home, and then halfway through the day they're playing on their game and they're having a ball with somebody online and they're just jumping up and down and they're, they're having a good old time. So you know they weren't really sick. Amen. So, evil plowing, evil praying. Uh, what would be the conditions of these type of people? And, and uh, who are they? What are they? Uh, first of all, in what condition are they? Number one, they are unable to please God. Now, this is not only for the non-Christian, but this is also for the, uh, let me put it this way, the half-baked Christian. Have you ever had anything half-baked? Have you ever had anything where you thought it was cooked and you ate it and there was still all kind of gooey stuff inside? And, and what, what did you do? Did you continue eating or did you, <laughs> you know, you kind of spit it out or did something, right? Because it, it just wouldn't taste right. Well, see, God does that to lukewarm people. He says, if you're not, be the hot or cold. God loves either honesty and integrity. So if you're going to be hot, be hot. If you're going to be cold, be cold. But don't claim lukewarmness. Don't claim that you're, you're a Christian, but you're lukewarm, because God says he'll spew you out of his mouth. So they're unable to please God. Could you put up Romans 8, 8, please, for me? Um, this morning, if you want to write these down, these references, it would help you And later on. In, in, uh, are people cold? Turn those fans off, Brother Bob. Um, Sometimes, you know, when we, the heat cuts off and we keep the fans on, it gets a little cool, so I just want to cut them off, please. Um, but it's, it's 70 degrees from what I can see here. I know some of you like Bahama weather, you know, in the 80s, but, you know, that would kind of be a little bit difficult. I think we'd all be sweating up here. And, and when you come up here and you've got all these hot lights on you, you know, it just makes you warmer, okay? Um, Romans 8.8 8 says this. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you know that there are some Christians that also walk in the flesh? There are some Christians that they claim Christianity, but they walk in the flesh. What do I mean by walking in the flesh? We're all in the flesh. I mean, we have bodies and we're walking. That's not what it's talking about. Remember I talked about, and you would, you would learn this in the principles that we're learning on Wednesday night, about how words can mean different things. And when the, you see this word flesh, it means the carnal nature, the old nature. 
And so they that are walking in the, uh, that are in the carnal nature, constantly living in the carnal nature, and if you read Romans chapter 7, chapter 6, together with Romans 8, you will have a greater understanding of this verse. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God. But this is some of the conditions of those who are evil plowing and evil praying. Number one, they are unable to please God. Number two, they do not satisfy God. Their, their satisfaction is all tied up in themselves. What makes them feel good, what makes, what's going to enhance their life, what's going to make them happy. It's not what makes God happy, what's going to enhance him and what's going to advance his kingdom. And so therefore, people like that are in the flesh are constantly, constantly thinking about themselves before they even think about God. Thirdly, the areas that are in, uh, uh, they are actually are an abomination to him because God says there that he's hateful. Uh, Psalm 11.5, I think I read that, didn't I? Did I read 11.5? Yeah, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence his soul hates. So there are, there are some that, that just love violence, and you have to be careful. Now, what are some of the areas of plowing? That the, uh, We're going to get into some scriptures, Proverbs. Uh, you can write these down if you want. Proverbs 15, verse 8 and verse 9, and verse 26. Proverbs 15, verse 8, verse 9, verse 26. Proverbs 21. Verse 4, Proverbs 21, verse 4, and verse 27, and Proverbs 28, verse 9. So I'm going to just uh, give you a little bit of, of, of those right now. They're involved in their commercial life or their work life or what they do for a living. Look at Proverbs 15 for a moment. We're going to go with verse 8. Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 8. We're going to talk about that this morning. It affects their commercial life or their, the, the, what has to do with earning a living. The Bible says the sacrifice of the wicked is an, evil, is an abomination to the Lord. Now, when we think of wicked, we think of murderers, rapists, But the wicked is considered those who are not moral. So think about that. Those who are not moral. And um, I'm going to take out my phone because I have something on there I want to read to you about that. If I can get it going. The word means... Wicked means wrong, bad, guilty, ungodly, them that do wrong. Now, even as a Christian, even as a Christian, if you're not being led by the Spirit, then you're not really a child of God. Because God's Word says, they that are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. If you're led constantly by your flesh and your fleshly nature and your, your own nature, and I, as I read before, then you, are, you better consi really consider your walk with God because your walk with God is the most important thing in life, more than money, more than positions, more than friends, more than anything. It's more important than anything else in your life. And, and uh, verse 8 says this, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. And I found this scripture very interesting. The word sacrifice here is talking about animal sacrifices. Now, why would the wicked be given animal sacrifices? Well, number one, if you notice in the Old Testament, a lot of times God was sick and tired of their oblations and of their sacrifices uh, to the Israelites because the Israelites were offering those sacrifices by simply just going out, buying the animal, having it slaughtered, having the blood, just going through the ritual of it. And it lost its intended meaning. The intended meaning was that they would go get the animal, see the life of that animal being taken, seeing that blood being shed, and that blood being 
apply to the mercy seat to cover their sin. And so therefore, they would have a motivational factor in their life not to continue doing what they were doing. But see, the sacrifice of the wicked is this. They just go, they buy the animal, they sacrifice it. The blood doesn't mean anything to them anymore. They don't apply the blood to their sin anymore. They just go through the ritual and just go through the, the, you know, the, the whole thing over and over again. And it's lost its meaning. Do you know that Christians do that when it comes to going to God and asking for forgiveness? Think about that. If you just keep going for the same thing day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and there's no change, you're doing exactly what the wicked do. You're taking the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ and you're trampling it under your feet. So it'll affect your living. In verse 9, it uh, talks about life in general. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he that loveth him that followeth, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. God's not expecting you to be perfect. Understand me what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about perfection, but I'm talking about a heart that will follow after righteousness. I'm talking about a heart that wants God. I'm talking about a person who's not satisfied where they are with God. I'm talking about a person who is willingly wanting to give their life and their will over to God. Now, how many of us, when we prayed that prayer to, of salvation, prayed something on this manner, Lord Jesus, come into my life, come into my heart, and be the Lord and Savior of my life? Or did you just say, be the Savior of my life? Which one did you do? If you just want Jesus for a Savior but you don't want him as Lord, you just cancel out him being your Savior. Because you can't have him just as, you can't uh, a la carte Jesus. You know, pick what you want. and Well, I'll take this here and I'll, and I'll leave that there. No, and I'll, I'll take that. No, and I'll, I'll want that there. No, you've got to take the whole of it. Now, let me talk about slavery for a moment. Slavery is bad. Amen? Everybody agrees slavery is bad. But Paul says, I'm a bond servant. I'm a bond slave. That's what the word doulos means in the Greek. And it means that he is voluntarily, he's not one taken captive by force by God. God doesn't force anybody to serve him. But God is asking you to voluntarily surrender your life to him and give your life over to him and let him control your life. And that's what it means to be a master. A slave didn't have any rights. If, I, if you were a slave and a slave owner said, you go shovel manure, you're not going to tell him, hey, that's not my job, that's not my job title. Okay, that's below my, 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 my pay grade. <laughs> no, you'd be dead or be whipped severely. Okay? But God doesn't want you to, he doesn't want to have to whip you he wants, if you're making him Lord and master of your life, then you should submit to him willingly. And you should, be, you should be following after. You should be going after what's right, righteousness. You know, uh, I, I've seen people, you know, when they, they go into a store and somebody gives them the wrong change, and instead of giving them like $5 change from their money, they give them like $15 from their change. And they walk out of the store and they go like, oh, wow, great, I had a, I'm blessed. Think about it. There's people that do that. And they go, oh, good day for me. Okay? But then there are people that are following after righteousness that say, no, that, that, that's not right. That's wrong. And they'll go back in the store. And it's so funny because the people in the store look at you like you're crazy. Okay? They look at you like, is this an idiot? This is a nut. If this happened to me, I'd be walking along. See, they, that's the wicked. That's what they do. See, you and I... As Christians, we have to show the example when we're by ourselves. You follow after righteousness, and that's what, that's what we want to do. But it also uh, goes to, and this is a big one, man. This is really big. Okay? In chapter 15, verse 26, 
It goes into your thought life. Evil plowing, even in your thought life. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. But the words of the pure are pleasant words. I remember Brother Norman used to say this, God changed my stinking thinking. You have to change the way you think, even the very thoughts that go into our mind. Do you know that the thoughts sometimes are not your thoughts? Sometimes the enemy puts those thoughts in your mind. And you have to be able to decipher between your voice, the devil's voice, and when it's God. But how are you going to do that? How do Christians do that? How do you discern between the enemy's voice, your voice, and God's voice? It's very simple. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. You can write that down. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable worship. Some translations have service, but if you look it up in the Greek, that word service means worship. Worship isn't just coming to church and lifting your hands. Worship is a life. It's your lifestyle, how you live. So, and be not conformed to this world... Verse 2, but be ye transformed. How is that done? By the renewing of your mind. For what purpose? That you may prove what is that perfect good will of God. So to prove what is of God, you've got to renew your mind. You've got to change your thinking. You've got to allow God to speak to your mind. And rather than yourself speaking your mind and yourself driving you and yourself telling you where to go and what to do, you need to ask God, what do you want me to do? Sometimes God will have you just sit in silence. Sometimes God will tell you to take a bus and you have a car and you have a license. And you don't understand why God wants you to take the bus. But sometimes God has another purpose. You never know. God's looking at our thought life, too. Do we think different than what we should? Are we assessing things different? Always looking in the natural? Always looking in the rational, in the rationale, rather than trusting God's Holy Spirit that lives inside of us? You know, there are times when we must prepare, but there are times when we need to also allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in times when we need him. Because sometimes you don't have enough time to prepare. And God will give you the words that you need to speak at the time you need it. So your thoughts have to be in tune with what God is thinking. Amen? It even affects your religious life. Look at uh, chapter 15, verse 8. 15, verse 8. We just talked about that. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. What's the prayer of the upright? The prayer of the upright is praying God's will. The prayer of the upright is, is, not all, is not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. And Jesus prayed that prayer. Now, I know there's some faith teachers on television that tell you, never pray that prayer. It's, an, it's, 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 it's bad. And that's not true. They say, never pray for God's will. I've heard them say that. But no, you pray for God's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You pray for God's will for your life. You pray that God will begin to manifest that purpose for your, for your life. Because every single person within the sound of my voice, you have a purpose of why you were born. You were just not born because your mother and father had a relationship and you came, and you came to this earth. No, God had a specific design plan for you. And the devil is the one that's trying to rob, steal, kill, and destroy that plan. And if you don't get your mind in tune with God's plan and God's word, you're going to miss out on this life for what God has for you. Those who are in this condition or that condition, uh, the wicked, here's the contrast. In, in chapter uh, 15, verse 8, you see the wicked and the upright. In chapter 15, verse 9, you see the wicked versus the follower after righteousness. In, in chapter 15, verse 26, you see the wicked and the pure. Now, who are they? 
What's the identification of this? Number one, anyone who is not righteous. Who is a wicked? Anyone who's not righteous. Wow. Righteousness comes from God. We receive righteousness for, uh, 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 in Christ. We receive that righteousness in Christ. But it's not just the receiving saying, okay, now I got the righteousness of Christ, and you just go do whatever you want. When you have the righteousness of Christ in you, and you receive the righteousness of Christ, there is an, there's an, a real strong desire for you to do what's right. Now, don't get me wrong. You're going to have that old nature, that old you, rise up at different times and want to take control back. That's why we're in a battle sometimes 24-7. Sometimes that old nature wants to just scream out and say, go do this. It'd be fun. Go do this. You need this. Go do that. You need that. Go, you, need, you, need to have, you need to have this in your life. You need to have that in your life. Oh, you're missing this in your life. You're missing that. You've got to go get that. Go after that. And God says no. You know how many times God said no to me? If I was to, if I was to sit down and get depressed every time God said no, I'd be, I'd be a mental case. Because there's things that we want, there's things that desires that we want, and God says no. Would it be nice? Would it be, would it be fun? Yeah. But guess what? There's a price to be paid. Okay? And a lot of times we can't. And if you truly surrender to God, you won't. Amen. Hallelujah. Righteousness comes from Christ. So let's define it. It's not just evil, wicked, or vile people. Anyone who has not accepted God's righteousness as provided in Christ is among the wicked in this particular section. The unsaved are the wicked, but so can some Christians be wicked. I preached a message a few weeks ago, converted but unbroken. There's a lot of Christians in the church today. In fact, there's a lot of unsaved people in the church today. Okay? And just because they're all in one place and they're all lifting up their hands, they do that at concerts. Doesn't mean that they're worshiping God. I remember Striper uh, was a, a rock group in the early 80s. It uh, was a Christian uh, rock group. Uh, and it was heavy metal rock group. Okay, And uh, they would show... Uh, they would show the concerts that were going on, and what they would do, they would throw Bibles into the, into the audience, and people would scramble after it, and, you, and the, you know, Christians were so gullible, they said, oh, look at them, they're so hungry for God's Word. They weren't hungry for God's Word, they just wanted, a, they just wanted a, uh, something that was handed by the, by the rock group. They just wanted, a, you know, a little something to show that, you know, a souvenir, yeah, that's the word I was trying to find, a souvenir, okay? But I saw a video one time of people in China that didn't have Bibles and someone snuck some Bibles to them and when they, they said we have the Bibles and they opened that thing the people came running and they were grabbing it and when as they were grabbing it they were taking the Bible and they, they were opening it up and they couldn't believe they had the entire Bible and, and they were kissing it and they were hugging it and they wanted that because they don't have that Do you believe that's still going on today in some regions in the world? They're not allowed to have this Bible. We have four or five in our house, and we don't read them. And I love it when people give the excuse, well, I'm not a reader, but they'll be on the Internet for five hours. <laughs> you're reading. It's just a different format, but you're reading. Or they'll sit in front of television for four hours. You're still reading. You're taking in information. You're deciphering information. You're listening to what someone's saying. It doesn't mean it has to be written down. You're listening to someone talk, and you're deciphering in your mind the paragraph, the phrases, the sentences, and you're reading that way. That's what I believe. Hello? Why are they in this condition? Why are people, both the wicked and also non-committed Christians, in this condition? It's not because of wrong opinions. It's not because of serious mistakes or frequent or occasional transgression. The reason why they're in this condition, and listen very carefully, the reason why they're in this condition is because they refuse to do God's way. They refuse to do it God's way. 
They have determined to withhold themselves from his service. I don't care what God says. I'm doing what I want to do. It's my choice. God gave me that choice, and I'm choosing not to. You can get him some water. You need some water? No? Okay. They have determined to withhold themselves from his service. They hold that they have the right to determine their own lives in their own way. And if you're determined to do your own thing and live your life your own way, then you'd be better off to go back into the world and just go back and do your thing and go sin and do whatever because you're, it's, it's going to be worse off for you because especially if you know the truth and you turn away from it, it's like way worse. And they thus deliberately ignore his will. Some are deliberately ignoring God's will. Do you know what a blessing it is for God for you to even know his will? What a blessing that your eyes are open to know God's will. And yet, you, you just don't want it. Or you allow the things in life and the people in life that have hurt you and, and, and done things to you. And God says to you, no, you need to release them. You need to let them go. And you say, no, I will not. I will not let them go. I'm going to hold them into bondage. It's amazing. So what happens then is they live in fixed rebellion against God. If God says you must do it in a certain way and you do not do it, that is rebellion. Hello? I can hear that little cricket around. Listen to me now. If you know God says to you to do things a certain way and you do not do it, that is rebellion. And then what is God, how does God look at rebellion? Say it louder. As the sin of witchcraft. Why? What is, what's involved in witchcraft? Manipulation, domination, and intimidation. That's why God looks at it that way. Neglect of his holy law, you cannot keep his law without accepting his righteousness. But it's biblically true. You can't have both. You can't keep sowing, can't keep plowing in the wrong field, in the wrong direction. You can't plow, your, your, you can't expect growth in a product if you keep sowing it in the wrong field. In other words, what do I mean by that? Everything, everything has its proper place to be sown. You're not going to plant an orange tree in Alaska. Not going to work. That's why the orange trees are in the south. Okay? You're not going to build an igloo in California. Everything, you're not going to put a fish in a zoo. You take him out of his element. He belongs in water. He'll only survive in water. He was built to survive in water. When you're a Christian, you're not built to live in this world the way that the world lives. You don't have to be fashionable. And I tell this to women all the time that, you know, if they ask me a question, and I tell them, and it's really not my place to tell them, it's like the women are supposed to tell them, but sometimes the women don't tell them, so I have to tell them. When you dress, dress properly. Dress modestly as a woman of God, like you're showing forth the righteousness of Christ in your life. There's nothing more attractive to a man who's a real Christian to a woman who dresses properly. Because if he's hungering and thirsting after God and righteousness, he's going to want you to dress properly. 
not with low cut blouses, short skirts all the way up to here. Now that's a pleasing to the flesh. But if he's truly a man that wants God and wants the things of God and righteousness, guess what? He's going to want you to dress modestly. Not because he's jealous, because somebody will take you away from him. Because you will honor God and you honor him in your relationships. Amen? Same way, same way with men. Okay? And I've said this many, many years ago. You know, I don't believe women want to see your ugly, hairy chest. Okay? So button your shirt where it belongs. You know, we're not back in the 70s like the, you know, with the, uh, yeah. Yeah, when, you know, with your shirt buttoned all the way down to here. Who cares? I don't want to see that. As a man, I don't want to see that. Yuck. Okay. So how do we escape that bad condition? How do we escape sowing into bad ground? And praying. Remember, the prayers of the wicked, God doesn't hear. So first we have the sacrifice of the wicked, which is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Then we say the way of the wicked is an abomination, what they do. Then we saw the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination. But look at Proverbs 21.4. Proverbs 21.4. We're talking about sowing now. Always remember, you're going to sow what you reap. Plant an orange, you're going to get an orange. Plant an apple, you're going to get an apple. 21.4 says, A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. A proud look. You ever see a proud look? I'll tell you, I won't mention any names, but I know somebody, okay? And then you look at that picture, all you see is pride. Linda knows who I'm talking about. Okay? But all you see is pride, a proud look. <laughs> like, a, you know, a can of Coke and a bag of chips, you know? Or whatever they say they're saying is. I don't know what it is. All that and a bag of chips. A proud look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Plowing of the wicked. In other words, what, they're, what are they plowing for? They're plowing to, to sow something in you. Now, you know what happens? Let me give you an example. This is for the guys, okay? So girls, this doesn't apply to you. Guys, you're walking down the street going into a store or something, and all of a sudden this girl comes out and she's got these high heels on. And she's looking snazzy. Okay? She's looking good. Okay? And she walks by and she winks at you and says, hi. You know, like Brother Diamond said, you know. <laughs> you know, she gives you that hi, and her voice says, she wants to talk with you. Go talk to her. And then self kicks in and goes, yeah, I'll talk to her about Jesus. You ain't going to go over there and talk about Jesus. Stop it. But when that thought comes into your mind, okay, this is when you need to, you need to abort that thought. Take that seed and abort that seed out of your mind. Say, you know, I abort that seed out of my mind. It's not going to take root in me. Because see, that's where it happens. It starts with a seed. It starts with something being implanted. And then you let that seed grow and grow and grow. And then all of a sudden the seed becomes more visible. Okay? And then as it becomes more visible, then you start to want to act on it. When you want to start to act on it and you get into the act of it, that's when it got you. The plowing of the wicked is sin. Don't envy the wicked. Don't envy those who are rich. Don't envy those that have a lot of things. Because you know what? Some of those things is what keeping them from accepting Christ. Jesus said it this way. How hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom. You know why? Because they can't forsake all for Jesus. They're not willing to forsake all. Maybe 20%. 
but not all. In Proverbs 28, verse 9, He that turneth away his ear. Everybody there? Everybody got you? Okay. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law or God's word, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Are you hearing me? When you refuse God's word, when you refuse, you will not listen to counsel. You will not listen to what God's word says. You will not adhere to God's word. You're putting yourself in a position where you think you know more than God. Hello? When you turn your ear away from hearing the law, that means when you are willing to walk in an opposite direction of what God's word says for you, God says, don't do that, and you say, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Guess what? Your prayers shall be an abomination to the Lord. Wow. Hello? Where are you plowing? Are you plowing? Are you plowing wickedness? Evil? Are you plowing evil praying? Are you revengeful in your praying? Lord, you know that person did me wrong. And we try to get spiritual about it, though. You know, we say, your word says, Lord, pour coals of fire upon his head. I can't wait for the day, Lord, when you pour coals of fire on his head. The Bible says, no, don't rejoice when your enemy stumbles or falls. Don't, don't do that. That will happen automatically. But that should not be the motive of our praying. We can't, we can't pray and expect God to hear us if we're not walking right. One of the things that really bothers me a lot is when I see kids in the supermarkets or I don't know why it seems to be more supermarkets than anywhere else. These kids just start screaming at the top of their lungs and they do a three stooges on the floor. And they start twirling around, you know. They want something, they want candy, or they want cookies, or they want something, and the mother's not giving it to them. The thing I hate the most is not the kids screaming and yelling, but after five minutes of that, the, the, the parent gives in and gives them what they want. That's what I hate the most. Because you know why? Yeah, that shut the kid up, but it also told the kid something else. If I scream long enough and cry long enough, I can get whatever I want. Okay? And that's why we have millennials today that can't, can't do anything. Because you, if you spank them, oh, forget it. They're going to call DSS. You're going to have police over your house. When we turn our ear away from this word, that's why when a, when a, when a parent disciplines their child, now listen to me, disciplines their child, okay? The Bible says, spare not the rod. You won't kill them, <laughs> okay? But the thing is, where parents make a mistake is they, they discipline their kids and they spank their kids in anger. That's where they make the mistake. I gave the illustration a long time ago of, of, a, of a mother, a father told her, the kids not to run in the house. And the kids was running in the house and he had, he had been given an antique lamp that belonged to his great-great-grandmother. It was worth a lot of money. And he told the kids, don't run in the house. And the kid was running around the corner, his foot got caught in the cord and off came the lamp and it crashed and, bu and broke. The father grabbed a hold of that kid and he says, get over here. And he started disciplining him, spanking him. But he was spanking him. And when he was spanking him, he was spanking him like this. I told you not to. Look what you did to my great-grandmother's lamp. And he's, you look what you did to the lamp. Look what you did to that lamp. So the kid grows up thinking that the lamp is more important to you than him. 
proper way of discipline is, I'm going to spank you, and you deserve it, because you disobeyed me. And the child will equate punishment with disobedience and authority. And that's where they need to learn from, is when they disobey, not because they broke something that was valuable, but because they disobeyed your authority. And so what happens today is the kids are running all over their parents because they're not being disciplined. So any parent that you're disciplining your child, not in anger, but the proper way, I commend you. You don't beat your child, you discipline them. There's a whole big difference. Not child abuse, but discipline. Listen to this Soulish compassion can cloud spiritual discernment. Soulish compassion can cloud spiritual discernment. I'll say it again so you can write it down. Soulish compassion can cloud spiritual discernment. Is the air condition on? That's not good. We've got to check that out, Pastor, because that happened last week, too. I'm going to look on the heat here and see why that's doing that. Yeah, see, it's, the heat point is set at 60, and I don't know why it's done doing that. Come on, heat. Yeah, the, you, can't, you can't set that. There we go. We can't set that to uh, something's wrong with it because it's the air conditioning's coming on and people are cold. They've got coats on and I'm looking, I'm going. And I looked over and I saw the, I said, no, that's not right. Soulless compassion can cloud spiritual discernment. Sometimes we think God will just bless us anyway. Sometimes he does, but sometimes he, he does that so that you're good, so that what he's doing for you good will bring you, lead you to repentance. But not that he's in agreement with what you're doing. He's not in agreement with how you're living. But he's blessing you to get you to the point of seeing his blessing and seeing how good he is and how bad you've been behaving, and that you need to repent and get right with God. Amen? I'm reminded of the prodigal son, and <clears throat> I'm going to close with this. The prodigal son went out and spent all his father's inheritance. Can you imagine that? He inherited one, one uh, half of all that you own, and you give it to your, your son, and he goes out and squands it on prostitutes and riotous living, buying people drinks and partying and having a good time. And then when he spends everything and he's in want, no one gives to him. You ever read that? Read that in the prodigal son. It says, no man gave to him in his time of need. That's God ordained. God ordained sometimes for you not to give. You actually can get in the way of God by giving and hindering God of what he's trying to teach a person. And that's why, you know, you have to be careful. You have to pray and say, God, do you want me to help this person? And when you help this person, it's hopeful that that person will see the love of Christ, the mercy of Christ, the glory of Christ through your sacrifice and will come to Jesus. But when they don't, there is no second time. There is no second time. Sometimes, they, sometimes people have to go the second route and lose everything all over again and no man give unto them to get them to that point of surrender. We have to be careful that we don't get to that point. Amen? So don't sow or don't plow with evil thinking. Don't let your sacrifice be an abomination to the Lord. Don't let your way be an abomination to the Lord. Don't let your thoughts be an abomination to the Lord. 
And don't plow in pride and arrogance of your life. And don't turn away your ear from hearing the word of God. So many people today, they live in op, what I call optional Christianity. Optional Christianity. Well, I can opt in and I can opt out. Well, if I don't want to do it, I won't do it. They don't realize the eternity when they stand before Christ. What that's going to cost them. Has this been a blessing to you? Amen. Don't, don't plow in, in evil ground. Don't let the enemy take your, your vision away from proper plowing. And I remember a scripture, my wife, I know I said I was close, so I'm not lying. I'm just, <clears throat> my, my wife uh, had this vision, or God spoke to her this. Any man putting his hand to the plow looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Think about that. Any man that puts his hand to the plow, what happens if you look back? You're plowing all over the place. <laughs> and I'm talking about those old hand plows now. You know? If you're looking back like this, always wondering what's going on there, you're not going to plow a straight furrow. You're going to be all over the place. So can I challenge you this morning? Keep your hand to the plow. Keep plowing that which is good. Plant the good seed, not the bad seed. Don't let your prayer become an abomination. Don't let your sacrifice become an abomination. Don't let your thoughts become an abomination. And especially don't let your way be an abomination. But let your life be sent, surrendered and given over to Christ and serve him and him only, especially as we see the day drawing nigh. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand in closing. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. And I, I pray that, God, I was able to bring this word the way that you wanted it. Not in condemnation, but in a way of showing people that pride and arrogance and sowing our own way, doing our own thing is the wrong choice. That, God, we can make the better choices. And, Lord, I pray that no one here today and no one on the, the sound of my voice on Facebook will turn their ear away from hearing the word, hearing the law, so that it doesn't become abomination to you, Lord. I pray that they will have ears to hear, hearts to hear, eyes to see, and the willingness to obey your word and follow and walk in your ways. I pray you bless their going in, their, their going out, their lying down, their rising up. I pray, Lord, that your face will shine upon them and that you give them peace and that you give them direction for their life. Lord, I pray you put a blessing upon them, Father, when they seek you for your, and your righteousness, then all these other things will be added unto them. But, Lord, let them not put it backwards. Let them not seek all these other things and then your righteousness. But, Lord, let them seek you and your righteousness first. Then all these other things will be added. Bless your people today, and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Be blessed.